Okay, good morning. Um, I'm Simon Buchanan, and I'm a subject librarian at Sheffield Hallam, and my role is looking after engineering and maths. But I belong to a faculty team, faculty basis, it's called, so arts, computing, engineering, and science. And it's got a really, really bizarre mix of subjects in. So, I mean, it's a bit like a duck bill platypus, it seems to be made of off cuts for the faculty. <laughs> Uh, I don't read reading because they should belong together. So on my team we've got people looking after art and design, computing, mathematics, engineering, we've got PR, journalism and media. It's a really, really strange mix of subjects. And the different subjects got very different students got very different needs um, in terms of the information they want, when they use it, how they use it. Um, this has some knock all effects for our team. So one of the, it's been quite hard for us to come up with any standardised method of teaching because all our students just use information, different types of information in very, very different ways. So, again, I didn't know how much map I was going to show you. Just give you some idea of the setup at Shepherd Hallam. This is our library gateway. This is Summon, not, we call it library search. Again, if I forget myself and call it library search, I mean Summon. Um, the other main tool we've got showing off our resources or the subject guides. So there's usually about one for each major subject. And again, that's give you some idea of what one of our subject guides looks like. So just be usually broken down by different types of material, and then we'll list the different databases, any works and so forth. Anyway, the different groups of students we've got and how they use information in different ways. So again, with one of my colleagues, I look after engineering students, CRT students, mathematics students. And again, the courses we've got to be very practical. They're very hands-on. So it generally works out that most students are not doing that much really serious academic research until their final year. And even then, some of them will be doing very, very practical projects. Um, so it means not actually using that much academic material. But it also means that what they do use is quite often quite esoteric stuff. It's not such traditional book, journal, and so forth. They're quite clear on things like standards, patents. They give quite a lot of business information, like market research reports. Again, in terms of subjects and resources, we've done, this area's done really, really well out of summer. Um, we've already had a lot of electronic material. So lots of e-books, lots of e-journals, lots of stuff you can find very, very easily through summer. Um, and just recently, one of the few areas where we can be able to get access to standards, standard documents. We now can. The British standards, we've got, we have ACM standards too, all of which you can find through summer. It's absolutely brilliant, because I've had academics who've been here for years saying, do we have British standards? We've had British standards for decades. <laughs> now they can actually see it for themselves. So at the stage where the vast bulk of material they want, they can get to very easily through summer. And in terms of teaching, you've got inductions to the first years to actually make sure they know where everything is, to actually find books, they know where to look, know where to get help. And depending on the class, sometimes you get extra classes to talk a bit more about evaluation, a bit more about referencing. The final years, because again, these students won't have actually done that much research for their dissertation, will get an extra session talking more about more in-depth research, some of the sorts of outside summer. And then the postgrads will get all of that, plus they get some extra help on referencing and actually advanced reading skills. Art and design, again, they're very practical students. So a lot of the work they're doing is very hands-on, we're doing much research in the final year. But again, a big part of their course is business. Because again, selling what they produce, marketing it, is a really, really big, important part of their course. So again, they want the market research, they want the company information. But the way they approach it is quite different. They're really, really keen on creativity and inspiration. So I think one of the ways this affects the teaching is they're not set tasks. They're not told, go out and find a book, find a journal and so forth. Basically, they set off to do their own thing, because they're actually quite bad at working under instruction. They like to go out there, try it for themselves, start off from scratch. And in terms of the way someone delivers the sources to them, there are some issues. One is that art design still uses an awful lot of print material. 
there's an awful lot of important stuff that isn't electronic full text. And there's some stuff we have to add records for to make it more visible to some. As a subject, they're also quite big browsers. So they quite often bypass any electronic catalogue or discovery tool altogether. They like to go to the shelves, pick things off, um, flip through things. So quite a big part of any induction and teaching is library tools, showing them where to find stuff, actually going to the shelves. One problem they also have about these is something is they tend to have quite nebulous subjects. So it's like I want you to do my dissertation on spirituality. And obviously, if you, again, this might be where the disciplines in Summon 2.0 come into their own. But if you're plugging a search term like that into a big general search engine discovery tool, you come up with a lot of irrelevant results. So quite often, the art students have benefited from using specialised art resources simply because it helps them narrow down these quite broad, vague terms they like searching for. But where some scored really highly through art and design is in the encyclopedias and reference works. Because again, they can just do a search and come up with articles from Britannica and art, both art online. And again, this would be where some 2.0 we were really sharp. Again, it's just a quick and easy search in Wikipedia. So they'll find these really good sources just as quickly as they ever could do with Wikipedia. And again, all the first things I've had their inductions. Um, subsequent to that, quite often, the contact the library has with me through one-to-ones. Again, because nature of the subject, because it's quite a woolly subject, and the way they search is quite odd searches, they quite often need a lot of one-to-one -one help finding things. And then we've also got the journalists and the media students and the PR students. And this is kind of the odd subject out, because it's much more traditional social science. So they're from, pretty much from day one, they're doing much more academic research. So they need to know how to search very much early on in the course. But part of being a journalist also means they've got a very, very, very broad focus. They might want to research pretty much anything. So this means that inevitably, some of it will go outside the edges of summer. They will need to use resources that someone just doesn't cover at the moment. Um, and unfortunately, as has been mentioned, there are some things absolutely key, like newspapers on Nexus UK, which really, really don't work at all well on some. So again, we have to, so, um, journalism, we have to refer them out to the subject guides, certainly some resources. Again, okay, well now they've got their first year induction, but because they're doing much more research much earlier on, they get a heavy dose of uh, library sessions in their second year. So they have four sessions, one on summon, I'm using that, but also two more on the other resources and one more on referencing. Because there's simply so much they might want to use, um, they get an awful lot of teaching to help them keep up with it. And but as we mentioned, one of the great things about summon is it actually requires very, very little teaching by and large. Um, even students who you might thought not particularly technical, not particularly IT, the art and design students, the journalism students, cope really well. You just throw them into it, they do fine. Um, again, after last year, this conference last year, I thought, well, I don't really need to give them any demo thing. What do you think to do without them? So cut them, up, cut them out of the session, worked absolutely fine. Uh, just to be on the safe side, okay, students hand out, explaining all the terms, what they need to click on. All the students ignored it didn't have any problems. So, and again, because spending much less time in demo, demos, what's also happening is students actually trying to ask themselves and to each other. So they're saving you a lot of work that either they'll ask you or they'll ask each other, I think quick and easy. And one of the things I have found is that obviously if you're delivering dozens of sessions, basically the same sessions to different groups of students, you get bored very, very quickly of teaching the same thing over and over. Because they're doing it for themselves, they're trying it out for themselves, each time it's a bit different, each time someone else is trying to discover a source that doesn't work or does something strange, needs a new bit of help, but at least it's variety. And it helps keep you interested. It's top you going insane by about November. <laughs> um, it also makes it a lot easier for us to share teaching. As I mentioned, we've got a really diverse faculty, really odd mix of subjects. But because it's the students going off and doing searching, 
You don't need to know the search terms for your colleague subjects. You don't need to know the weird databases and how they work. Um, students do it all themselves. It makes it a lot easier if you sort of swap over at the last minute, get someone else to help you. One of the things that everyone in my team has talked about, so it's a really strong, helpful thing, is that someone's really good for teaching journals. Because they're never going to be there at the top of the search results, students see journals exist. It's really easy to promote them. And also, because you've got peer review in the final search, it's an excellent chance to talk about peer review and show it off. And I think it's a good thing. Everyone likes journals. She's always really keen that students know about journals and how they work. However, as I mentioned, I spoke to our students aren't really doing that much academic research till their final year. They're not going to be heavy users of journals. And again, I don't think I'd ever, ever not talk about journals I mentioned for the first years. They're not really going to be using them all that much. Um, how much are they actually going to remember when it comes to the end? And again, I'll spend more time talking about journals than anything, any other type of material. As I mentioned, I'll see excuse and lots of, lots of material. They'll be using the standards of patients, the business information, conference papers, training papers, a real mix of material. But we end up concentrating on academic journals and possibly not explaining the whole mix and range of information that's out there because of that in a limited time. There's also an issue that's come up if you divide three subjects about whether you actually still talk about searching for a journal as opposed to journal articles. Again, so it's the even when it's done, no problem, <coughs> we do with postgrads. But for art and for journalism, they will still explain how to look for a particular journal. Because the idea of a key journal is still very strong. But for engineering, computing, maths, no, not really. We just set them off because it's so easy to find a journal article on a subject that you want. That the, possibly the idea of a key journal possibly drying out a bit, because you can go straight to the article. However, there is still a key problem, that when the link result fails, you still need to understand the process of getting through to an article, so again, it's an issue. But, yes, one, one thing I have found is someone is really, really good as an introduction to other databases. Because, again, the whole layout Final standardized list of results is so like every other database that's out there. All different times, even search engines are all adopting very, very similar layouts. So again, if you've got a bunch of students who are not doing that much academic research for most of their course, A, it's a really good demonstration that pretty much everything works like this database you're used to. You know how to behave. And you need to show off things like advanced search, facets, boolean, catalogue records, and so forth, that they'll need to know when they're getting on to their final year, doing the dissertations, or postgraduate work. So again, it's also a familiar face. So if they know they can use Summon, then, they, then it follows on, they can use these other resources. And of course, they're not going to have Summon when they go, when they leave the university. So it also helps them to know, this is transferable. They can take what they know from Summon, I need to tell swear. Again, there are some issues here. You some of my colleagues do you do you some as a contrast with subject databases to show up the strengths of subject databases. Again, there are one or two things, like citation searching or really, really complex search syntaxes for the advanced students, where you might need to go elsewhere to try it out. But with an introduction to how search works and the link through to other databases, it's really, really strong. Now, this is one of the picture terms that's beginning to affect me or no one else. So we can see all the first inductions primarily talking about summon, not much else. But again, we usually mention the subject guides and the sources there. By necessity, we've had to in the past, because there are some things you can only get to through the subject guides. However, this is going to be less, less the case of engineering. Uh, so this is the level I'm beginning to face with. Do away actually from my first years tell them anything else other than summon. And my thinking, for the time being at least, is I probably will. Um, again, what we're giving students to a certain degree is sausages. So it's, some, 
It's a product that's been processed and refined, served up. That's not actually how it starts. That's not how it originates. And again, my colleagues describe some of this academic Google. And that's probably a good way for us and the students to think of it. That it's not a thing that produces a single result. Um, but a whole collection of different material brought together. Again, one possible problem um, is that it lumps all sorts of different types of material in one search. And there's possibly a risk of students not realising differences between material, how it's used, um, it's different ideas behind it. Again, we can filter it really, really easily. So if you can explain that, that it's the differences, the different types of material, go into evaluation, go into what you use these different things for, that's, that's easy enough. But it does need mentioning. But of course, this is something you get with all sorts of databases, all sorts of search engines. They all bring together conference papers, trade papers, journal articles, all sorts of things in one place. So it's not unique to someone, but it does need addressing. There's also the issue of things breaking down. Uh, again, I mentioned what happens when you resolve this keel over, when there's a bit of metadata missing, doesn't go through to the article. Students need to understand, A, there's other, other resources they can go to when things break, but also the ways round, what else they can do to get through to a resource when something's missing or broken. And of course, because it's bringing so many odd things together, so many different things, there will be oddities. All these different resources do not mesh nice and cleanly. So again, one issue a lot of my colleagues brought up is that sometimes you get the um, book and ebook editions with a lot of volume together in a single entry, and sometimes it will be two separate entries, which sometimes means students think we've not got an ebook or we've not got a book, because it's not always consistent. Likewise, I've been really pleased because now I've got a few standards, it's really easy to find, but it's classed as an ebook. It's a bit peculiar. So again, students need to understand that this is a collaboration of other lots of different things brought together. This is not homogenous whole. So this is one of the issues to address, is make sure they understand exactly what they're getting when they do their search at the other end. Okay, I think it's, so again, if you need to get in touch, you can either get in touch with my boss, Claire Abson, or you get in touch with me. If you want to know anything more about this. Okay, if you don't have any questions at this stage, anything more they'd like to know? Yes? I'm going to go to the next section. I'm just going to comment. It's going to be some of the highest and heavy standards. It's just so unfortunate that it's not out of the ebook. Yes. So if you search for standards, you find a journal article standards. So there's something not right Quite clear, yeah. I do have a guest Yes. 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 Adam was familiar with section that it was just mentioning the issue with British standards that are currently classed as ebooks. There is a standard category and materials type, but um, unfortunately, British standards, if you look at any standards, they're classed as ebooks. It's a bit confusing when you're searching. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, again, again, I knew it was something you were working on, so, yes. <laughs> okay, anything else, Signoras? Okay, thank you very much.